Welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This show is about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your guest, Cameron Guerra, and I'm an engineer here at IT Pro TV. And with me today is your host, Cody Goodman. He's our one of our senior engineers here at IT Pro TV. That just means he's really, really old, right, Cody? Yep, I've got the gray hairs to prove it. Programming can do that to you, though. Well, I'm glad to have you on the show. Um, I wanted to take some time today and kind of talk about refactoring Haskell. I stumbled upon an article in Haskell Weekly this week that was about um, continuous improvement with HLint code smells. So we use HLint here at IT Pro TV um, to kind of enhance um, and kind of unify our code. Um, what are some things that you have experienced with HLint and, and maybe some of the I think right now, let's just kind of talk about HLint and then uh, maybe dive more into refactoring um, a little bit later. How's that sound? Yeah, that sounds good. So at IT Pro, we've been using HLint ever since I've been here. Um, something that is kind of annoying about HLint is it'll, it'll bug you about things like, uh, you know, use parentheses here instead of dollar signs. And that may conflict with your, your personal style or what you think looks more aesthetically pleasing. Um, but it also goes and it does more complex uh, recommendations to like, uh, you can do an edit reduce here. Uh, you can use point free here. It doesn't go to the extent of using composition with composition where you have three dots next to each other. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it provides sort of some common sense recommendations and it, it leads you to start refactoring code in a uniform way. And that's something really valuable across a code base. Hmm. Yeah, I know. I, I feel like I've really enjoyed having HLint. Sometimes it's like, oh yeah, I was supposed to take away those parens that I accidentally left. Like those are some of the smaller things it can do. But I also know like, you know, we use um, like map maybe and concat and it's like, and there's a cat maybe function that does the same thing. Like, or I don't know if it's cat maybe, but something like that, that does a very similar thing. So mm -hmm. it just says, hey, use this function instead of this function. And it kind of cleans up and, and minimizes the code, um, which is, which is nice to, to have that going into each file and having some sense of pattern and, and kind of um, just cleanliness um, around the code base, right? Yeah. I mean, you could have your Haskell looking like Lisp, but uh, you have, a have HLint, then you have some assurance it's going to be a lot more clear and you can focus on what the code's doing instead of all that noise. Right. And and I think it, it just kind of um, just, yeah, gets you back to coding efficiently, mm -hmm. which is really nice. So, okay, so we've got HLint. We use HLint. We've kind of experienced HLint. And, and this article kind of talks about four different like code smells that HLint has helped them with. One being function, uh, long functions. Another one being functions with many arguments. We have long type list. And then we have lots of imports. So something that like those things seem to kind of maybe clean up and minimize this um, expansive, you know, language that Haskell can be right. kind of minimizes a little bit to, to make maybe beginners and intermediate people kind of be able to come in and understand what's going on. Have you experienced any of that? I don't think we've really come across uh, any of those four in our code base that I've seen. So a lot of imports, uh, especially when you're just trying to hack something together, you can end up with that. Say you leave a debug.trace or something, HLint's going to catch that and you can remove it. And then, like you said, for newcomers who who are, are newer to Haskell, they might, if you're not using qualified imports, they'll be saying, you know, where's this function defined at? And if you have a ton of imports you're not using, it's going to be really hard for them to track it down. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, Cody. I think it, it does help intermediate. Only being in Haskell myself for a little over a year now, um, HLint's really kind of just kind of helped me shape my style like, like styles when I'm writing Haskell. I know you've written Haskell a lot longer than I have, so you probably have a little more uh, frustrations with HLint because it's like, I want you to do this when you really prefer to do it maybe another way. Um, but I think overall it helps all of us, any of the engineers here at IT Pro TV, come into our code base and understand, oh, this is, this is what we do. This is the style we have. This is set across all of our files and we know what's what. Um, I think that's really, really, really valuable valuable right and i think something actually useful when you're learning haskell is to use hlint follow all the suggestions and not only follow them but ask why you know why is it useful to transform this like that 
because there's a lot of experienced developers or at least one who came up with these different rewrite rules and they were there for a reason and they were born out of the experience that developer had. Yeah, no, which I think is really cool. One thing that I, I kind of wish Agelent did, which is probably just expecting too much, is kind of being able to take a function and kind of maybe analyze the way in which it's being performed and, you know, taking, okay, what are the inputs? What's the output? Okay, let's see how they wrote the code to make this work. I wish it would be able to, like, maybe look at it and say, hey, like, you should probably break this up or you should kind of kind of shift things around because it, it seems a little it's too conglomerate like there's too many too complex. uh too complex right sorry conglomerate doesn't really make sense there uh, but yeah too complex and those functions are know. starting a business right <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> but you know say we have anonymous functions instead of anonymous functions like being able to say hey let's pull this out and and right. like those kind of things may be nice it, because i know this week you and i both had run a come across some code in our code base that was you know it worked, but it was very, like, thick. You know, it's hard to fully comprehend. Right. And uh, it it actually wasn't even that it was that large either. Um, it was kind of the... I, I think the fact that in one place we, we took advantage of partial application where you have to read from right to left to understand it. And then we had a lambda inside of there, which is left to right. I think that was sort of the thing that made it hard to follow. Mm -hmm. And then when you when you add or reduce that, you get the advantage of it all being right to left typically, mm -hmm. and that that's really valuable. Mm, yeah. So if Agent could have maybe identified that, like we had conflicting styles, right? And it could have been like, right. hey, like let's let's reevaluate this. Like if you want to stick to point free, okay, stick to point free, but don't be jumping all these things in here. Don't mix. You know, partial application with lambdas, like that doesn't make for easy readability. Right. Uh, so I think for us, that would kind of be maybe a nice thing to have. But nice thing is Haskell makes refactoring a little bit pretty easy. Because mm -hmm. the, the problem we had was, was kind of complex. We had, you know, a document that had a list of, in our case, it was users. And we wanted to kind of create a map that had that one of those users tied to another value on that document. And so, you know, say we had 10 users, we wanted to have a map with 10 entries. And then we were actually doing that over a list of those documents. So it was kind of, uh, it was just like a lot going on. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we, we have some helper functions that we've used to kind of group things, but that didn't really fall into this, like this category wasn't there. And right. so, you know, to begin with, I just was like, Hey, let's, like I was working with Jason and we're like, Hey, let's just figure out how to make this work. Like mm -hmm. we know what the type signature looks like. Like let's just let the compiler happen. But obviously we, we put that out for PR and we're kind of like, ah, this seems rough. Like there was code smell, right? right. There was like, there could be something better here. So, mm -hmm. um, I wish, I mean, that would have been kind of cool if, if H link could have done something like that for us. Like mm -hmm. then, Hey, let me yeah. Evaluate. And I think it would definitely be possible, uh, Although difficult for H. Clint to say, oh, uh, your code is from right to left because of usage of composition here, then in this lambda, it is left to right. I think that's something that could be added. Uh, then you were kind of hinting at uh, complexity, mm -hmm. and there is an existing existing calculation to, to figure that out, which is called cyclomatic complexity. Hmm. And uh, that, that's pretty interesting. Does H. Clint have that? Uh, I don't think so, but uh, it would be interesting to start an issue about that and have a discussion. Yeah, I really would. Hmm. Maybe maybe we'll see if that could be put into place. Sure. Um, no, but I think that's really awesome. Oh, uh, yeah, you going to say something? Like, you know, yeah, like, yeah. I was going to say that our specific problem, what helped make sense of it to me is that, you know, we we had that set of users and then we we could easily turn that into a map. But from that map, we needed to, uh, the map's values had a, another list of users and we needed to basically expand the map out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was what kind of made it difficult. And, and you might reach for a fold in that situation, but uh, something that's oftentimes easier is 
is making a lot of maps and then unioning them together, mm -hmm. which is where we ended up. Good old union with with the, because <laughs> also the map had, um, you know, the key was a user ID, but the you know value within that was a list, and so um, unioning that with Simi Group, you know, allowed us to get exactly the result we were expecting. Um, right. And it and it cleaned it up because um, we and we felt like when Jason and I wrote it, we felt like there could be a better way to do this. Like we knew that there was some sort of just kind of something wrong. Like we were, we felt like we could have you know, we changed things from a set to a list because you know we right. deal with a set. And then we were like, we felt like we we could have left that as a set and done the operation mm -hmm. that we needed to, and which was what we ended up getting to, which was really right. cool. Um, but you know. In this case, HLint didn't necessarily save the day, mm -hmm. but in a lot of other cases, it has, and, and yeah. I'm very thankful for HLint. Um, I think you're getting at a sort of unique selling proposition of Haskell, which is that you can you can not only sort of write the code that just works quickly, the compiler will help you do it, mm -hmm. and then once you write it, even if you're not proud of it, you know that when you want to go refactor it, mm -hmm. you have a lot of guarantees. It's way easier to to actually, you know, hack the code, get it out there real quick, and then have the confidence you can come back later without breaking things and improve upon it. Mm -hmm. No, and I really value that aspect of, of Haskell. I think it's, like for us, coming from a JavaScript background, um, mo most of us, we kind of dealt with, you know, like, don't touch that code. Like, you don't know what the <laughs> side effects will be. It, it right. a, it's a ball of mar like it's a bowl mm -hmm. of marbles. Um, but being able to say, okay, like we're in a compiled ha language that's strongly typed. Yeah. Like, that value is just tremendous because anytime you need to come back and refactor, like you have confidence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that everyone should get on board with and join and love Haskell because mm -hmm. it it really gives you that confidence and that peace. Like you, you know, I, I remember you know, a year, year and a half ago when I was writing JavaScript and I'd go, go reopen some old controller or model or mm -hmm. action that I wanted to mess with. And I would just be like, have this sense of stress of like, I'm touching something like, is this going to work? Is our test suite going to catch this? Like, yeah, because that's all you have in JavaScript. Like you don't necessarily like, and user testing, like, you know, but that's all you got, you know, like, yeah. Haskell, we have, we have strongly typed languages, which makes that kind of refactor mm -hmm. nice. And then it has when we have tooling like HLint and Brittany and yeah. things that kind of, you know, keep us you know, within lines, within guards. Um, whereas right. like, you know, JavaScript, you can, it's wild, wild west. Like, yeah, you have ESLint yeah. and stuff like that. But um, I think HLint is just leaps and bounds above um, ESLint or any other, you know, mm -hmm. in my, in my opinion, I, you know, I could be wrong and I'm sure somebody on the internet may want to tell me I'm wrong and that's okay. <laughs> but in my opinion, like HLint, for me in Haskell is great. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it leads you to like HLint, those, those different rewrites that it does, how you can glean understanding of why that those happen. Just the act of refactoring something can, can lead you to, to understand the, the nature of the problem you're working on as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, an economic factor of deciding to rewrite something that's a code smell that I think a lot of people don't take into account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's fair. Well, Cody, I think uh, we've, we've had quite quite the show here, quite the uh, the talk on you know HLint and, and even refactoring a little bit in, in Haskell. I know there's could be even more to talk about, but you know we want to keep our respect our listeners' time and uh, sign off. So uh, you know, shoot it over to you. All right. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, thanks for being on the show with me today. Uh, thanks for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This has been episode eight. If you liked our show, find out more at our website, haskellweekly.news. Thanks again for listening. I've been your host, Cody Goodman. We'll see you again next week. Adios.